So recorder is on and we'll begin with the first video. And welcome to the Satellite Bible Atlas, video number six, map one four. The focus of map one four is the Jezreel Valley and Lower Galilee. The general location of the terrain of map one four is situated in the north central area of the land of Israel. We described in video number three how the Jezreel Valley is a wide flat plain between the central hill country to the south and mountainous Galilee to the north. This makes the Jezreel Valley a hub of international routes that crisscross Israel, a kind of grand central station. Before we take a closer look at the Jezreel Valley and the routes that come in and out of the valley from all directions, let's first see the regions that surround the Jezreel Valley. To the west is Mount Carmel, including the Shvela or foothills of Carmel. Northwest is the plain of Asher, which spreads out from the modern seaport city of Haifa on the slope of Mount Carmel to Akko Ptolemais in the north. North of the Jezreel Valley is Lower Galilee, a series of east to west running mountain ranges that are bisected by wide plains. Note the town of Nazareth on the mountainous ridge just north of the Jezreel Valley. On the east, note eastern Lower Galilee, and to the southeast, Mount Gilboa. Between eastern Lower Galilee and Mount Gilboa is the wide Herod Valley, which serves as a route to and from the east. Finally, note the Jordan Rift Valley, including the Sea of Galilee and the lower Jordan River Plain. From a high spot on Mount Carmel, let's get a view of the Jezreel Valley from west to east. Note the agricultural productivity of the Jezreel Valley. The name Jezreel means God will plant. Looking across the valley, some 10 to 15 miles away, are the Nazareth Ridge, Mount Tabor, and the Hill of Moray. Turning just a bit to the south, here's the Hill of Moray, the Herod Valley, and Mount Gilboa. Now let's take a closer look at the routes and site locations associated with the Jezreel Valley. One Bible geographer called the Jezreel Valley a stage with entrances and exits that lead to and from other nations. The southwest entrance exit of the Jezreel Valley leads to the coastal plain and ultimately to Egypt. These gates are called the Mount Carmel Passes. They follow valleys that pass through Mount Carmel. Where the passes enter the Jezreel Valley, one pass is guarded by the city of Megiddo, the other by Jokneum. Above Jokneum on Mount Carmel is the traditional location of Elijah's contest with the prophets of the Phoenician god Baal. We're on Mount Carmel, where Elijah contested the prophets of Baal, showing that Baal was nothing and Yahweh was the true God. Here is an aerial photograph of the ruins of Megiddo, well situated to oversee activity in the Jezreel Valley. Most importantly, Megiddo supervised the important pass connecting the Jezreel Valley with the coastal plain. The modern highway runs through the Megiddo Pass. Map 2-5 shows a campaign of Pharaoh Thutmose III. This Pharaoh may be the one who caused Moses to flee to Midian. Thutmose III made multiple campaigns into Canaan in an effort to secure control of trade routes in the plains. On one of those campaigns, Thutmose boasted of attacking Megiddo via the narrow Megiddo Pass. Giving a pep talk to his troops, he declared, Capturing Megiddo is like capturing 1,000 cities. The northwest gate of the Jezreel Valley is the Kishon Pass. All of the Jezreel Valley is drained by the Kishon River, which exits the valley along the foot of Mount Carmel to the northwest, ending at the Mediterranean Sea. The route follows the river along Mount Carmel to the plain of Asher. This Google Earth photo shows Mount Carmel and the Kishon Pass. The photo is oriented to the west. North is to the right. Here's the tip of the Jezreel Valley. Here's Mount Carmel. And the Kishon Pass that connects the Jezreel Valley to the plain of Asher and the Mediterranean Sea. Also visible are the Jokneum Pass through Mount Carmel and Tel Jokneum where the route joins the Jezreel Valley. 
as map 63 shows the Israel Phoenicia alliance in the days of Ahab and Jezebel utilized the Kishon Pass in the transfer of materials culture and religion between these two nations the north gate to the Jezreel Valley is the Shimron Pass the Shimron Pass uses a valley to join with an important east-west route that connects Akko with the Sea of Galilee more remote in the hills above this region is the village of Nazareth where Jesus grew up behind us is Nazareth the town where Jesus grew up We're here in um, Nazareth, and this is the hometown of Jesus. And he was teaching here in the beginning of his um, Galilean ministry in the synagogue. And the reaction from the people there was so strong that they wanted to, uh, they wanted to take him up to the um, brow of the hill, which is here. In the same hilly region near Nazareth, only two miles away, is Gath Hefer, the hometown of the prophet Jonah. Also nearby is Sephorus. An important Roman town, the regional capital of Galilee, when Jesus was a youth. To the north, across the wide Betnatofa plain, is Jotapeda, where the Jewish general and historian Josephus Flavius was captured by the Romans, and Cana, where Jesus performed his first miracle. Hi, we're here in the city of Sephoris near Nazareth, and behind me across the valley is the ruin of the city of Cana where Jesus did his first miracle, turning water into wine. Archaeological excavations at Cana have exposed a late 1st century AD building, which is likely a synagogue, including this base and pillar. The northeast gate exits the Jezreel Valley between the hill of Moray and Mount Tabor. Therefore, we call this gate the Tabor Pass. Right now, we're at a ridge near Nazareth, and to my right, you can see Mount Tabor and also the Valley of Jezreel, where Barak and Deborah fought a battle against Javan and Sisera of Hatzor, and where the Lord gave them great victory. Also behind me is the Mount of Moray, where a city known as Nain sits on the ridge. And that is where the Lord Jesus Christ raised uh, a son of a poor widow from the dead. The Tabor Pass is part of the great international route that connects with nations further north. Note the Wadi Arbel, where the route drops down to the plain of Gennesaret along the Sea of Galilee. This photo shows the Wadi Arbel region. The international route comes along the northwestern side of the Sea of Galilee, then north. On map 13, note the continuation of the Great International Route. From the Jezreel Valley to the Sea of Galilee, the route climbs north to the city of Hatzor in the Hula Valley. The route continues north in the Hula Valley to the region around Dan, where it branches to Lebanon, or Damascus of Syria, and beyond to Mesopotamia. The east gate of the Jezreel Valley is the Harod Valley Route, connecting the cities of Jezreel and Beth Shan. The Jezreel Valley is shaped like an arrowhead. The Harod Valley is the shaft of the arrow running along the north side of Mount Gilboa. On map 13, note how the gateway to the east, the Harod Valley, intersects with the important route in the Jordan Rift Valley at the city of Beth Shan. From here there is access up into Gilead. One route intersects with the Transjordan International Highway or the way to Bashan at the city of remote Gilead. Here is a beautiful aerial photograph from the Pictorial Library of Bible Lands collection. We're looking at Mount Gilboa and the Harod Valley from west to east. Here is the modern kibbutz and ancient Tel Jezreel, Mount Gilboa, the Harod Valley, the modern route in the Harod Valley maneuvering past irrigation and fish ponds to Beth Shan. Here's a portion of the Rift Valley and off to the east, the hills of Gilead. There are many biblical events that show the Harod Valley was an important route. As marked on map 46, the Lord chose 300 men in the days of Gideon at the Harod Spring, near the city of Jezreel at the base of Mount Gilboa. The Midianites were across the Harod Valley at the foot of the hill of Moray. When Gideon blew the trumpet, the Midianites panicked and fled down the Harod Valley, crossed the Jordan River, and tried to escape further east through Gilead. 
We are at the spring of Herod where the Lord chose 300 men in the days of Gideon to conquer the Midianites. In Saul's final days, the Philistines encamped at Shunem near the hill of Moreh. They were in a position to not only compete for control of the important routes in the Jezreel Valley, but also to drive a wedge between Israelite northern and southern tribes. King Saul gathered his forces at Jezreel and then snuck around the Philistines to get counsel from a witch at Endor to no avail. The next day Saul was wounded, retreated and died on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines found his body and hung it on the walls of Beth Shan. We're at Beth Shan. We're standing on a Roman street. And behind us is the mount is the Canaanite Israelite mound where the Philistines dragged Saul's body and hung it up. Ahab, the Baal worshipping king of Israel, killed Naboth of Jezreel and confiscated Naboth's land. Not long afterwards, Ahab convinced Jehoshaphat of Judah to go up to Remote Gilead to battle with the Arameans. Ahab was killed at Remote Gilead by a stray arrow. The Harod Valley to Gilead connection is illustrated by the wild chariot ride of Jehu, who is anointed to wipe out Baal worship in Israel. We're at the city of Jezreel. Behind us is the Herod Valley, and Jehu rode his chariot wildly up the valley and came here to the city, killing both the king of Judah and the king of Israel and having Jezebel thrown out the window. Very good. <laughs> That's it. And finally, the southern gate of the Jezreel Valley, the Bible calls the Ascent of Gur. The continuation of this route is shown on map 1-3. It ascends into the hills of Samaria at Iblium, and just before Dotan splits, one branch toward the city of Samaria and the other toward Tirza. The routes rejoin at Shechem, where it continues south on the watershed route, the road of the patriarchs. So these are the gates in and out of the Jezreel Valley. The Mount Carmel passes to the coastal plain in Egypt, the Kishon Pass to the plain of Asher, and the Mediterranean Sea, the Shimron Pass beyond the Nazareth Ridge, the Tabor Pass, a continuation of the great international route to the northeast, the Herod Valley route with connections to the Jordan Rift Valley and Gilead, and the ascent of Gur into Samaria. We're on Mount Carmel where Elijah contested with the, what was it, the Salina Ba? <laughs> Hey everybody, we're in the water system at Megiddo, which was carved by King Ahab of Israel. It is, uh, across the valley is the city of Cana where Jesus, okay, can we do this? <laughs> to fight, no, the Midianites who fought to, in the days of Gideon, <laughs> to go out and defeat the mm, Amorites, Ammonites, Midianites. <laughs> We're overlooking the Jezreel Valley, and behind me is Mount Tabor, where Deborah and Barak gathered 10,000. Um, we're standing here at Sephoris uh, in the sea. Ugh. All right, we're in Sephoris in Galilee, and right behind us is the city of Nazareth, where Jesus grew up. Right behind me. Oh, man, sorry. We are at Megiddo and we're overlooking the Jezra Valley. To the north is the Nazareth Ridge and <laughs> I can't remember. And to my right is, or left, uh... Is that you, Zimri, murder of your master? <laughs> is there anyone up there with me? <laughs> Throw her down! In where she died, and I forget where he had Jezebel killed by throwing her out the window. This pretty much wiped out the all worship in all the northern kingdom. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, let me share with you uh, our, our first map here. Uh, during the period of the judges, uh, 
It, this was the final and the complete entrenchment of the Israelites in the uh, Holy Land, both to the west and to the east of the Jordan Rift Valley. The Canaanites were divided among themselves, and they were unable to withstand the Israelites over an extended period. And as they became more and more compressed into smaller and smaller enclaves, they either fell or submitted to the Israelites. The victory at the waters of Meron that we talked about last week gave the conquering tribes a permanent foothold in the north up in Galilee in the process of settling down. And they were aided by close affiliation with a number of the local clans which still live there, which according to some sources other than the Bible made up the population inhabiting the Galilee of the nations, as they were called, prior to the final Israelite conquest. Now, whether these clans, such as the families that were assigned by the Bible to the tribes of Asher and Issachar, were blood relations of the conquering tribes uh, from before the Israelites went all the way down into Egypt, you know, a thousand or a couple of thousand years earlier or not, it doesn't change the fact that there must have been substantial force in accelerating Israel's takeover of much of this mountainous region of northern Canaan. Because when uh, Abraham first entered this region uh, after leaving Mesopotamia, he was part of this mass migration, as you remember from the, the first lesson. And so all of these peoples were somewhat uh, welded together into a heterogeneous mixture that was known as the Hyksos, but they were all sort of related. And not all of them made the trip into Egypt. So they were left behind and they may have somehow been related. Uh, now against this, keep in mind that the plains, like the coastal plain area and the Jezreel Valley were still securely in the hands of the Canaanites. Although the power of the two major uh, towns on the southwestern slopes of Lower Galilee, Shimron being one, which is located right here where I'm circling, and Axpa is the other one. It's not indicated on the map, but if you follow this road through the Kishon Pass and you notice the road forks, if you take the right fork and it's slightly around the bend, right around that bend is where the ancient city of Axpa uh, is believed to be. There's about three other places that they believe could be Axpa. Nobody really knows for sure. But uh, once the power of those towns uh, had been broken after the waters of Meron, another local ruler who was known as the king of the people in Galilee stepped into the void. So the natural allies of the king of the people in Galilee were the rulers of the remaining towns that skirted the Jezreel Valley. Uh, the most prominent of these was the king of Tanakh, located here, the king of Megiddo, and the king of Jokneum. And then the rulers of Dor, which is not if you, it's completely off the map to the west here. You see here, it's actually all the way over onto the Mediterranean coast. Uh, the, the rulers of Dor on the Mediterranean coast and Kadesh in northern Naphtali, up here. Keep in mind, this is different from the Kadesh located here. It's two different Kadeshes. Uh, and the major city of Hatsor, this was a major city at the time, they gave the coalition some added strength and, and some depth. Uh, the chief among these was Hatsor, and the king of Hatsor at the time was Jabin, J-A-B-I-N. And he was proclaimed to be the head of the league of all the northern Canaanite cities. The primary strength of the Canaanite petty kings was their fortified towns. But by simply remaining behind their closed gates, they couldn't subdue the Israelites. A more active course had to be pursued. Uh, and here their main military armament, of course, was the war chariot. It was invaluable. Uh, mobile patrols of charioteers could control the plains and more specifically the roads 
which afforded uh, protection to trade caravans and all other road traffic. So to provide more cohesion to the coalition, the overall command of this combined effort was given to Sisera. Sisera was the commander of Jabin's army in Hatzor, and he was probably a chief in his own right. So things came to a head when Sisera occupied Harashet of the Gentiles, which is located, again, it's not depicted on this map, but it's right here uh, at the smallest, narrowest point of the Kishon Pass. Uh, and once he occupied that, that controlled all traffic leading from the Jezreel Valley to the plain of Asher and the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, at this time, the, the loose coalition of Israel was headed by Deborah, who was one of the judges. So, uh, Janet, you have the first reading? Yes. <clears throat> so this is chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Yes. At this time, the prophetess Deborah, wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel. She used to sit under Deborah's palm tree, situated between Ramah and Bethel, in the mountain region of Ephraim. And there the Israelites came up to her for judgment. Okay. Uh, in my email, I, I kind of put a short description of what the judges were, who they were. I hope you had a chance to read that. Mm -hmm. uh, so from, uh, from Miriam, who was the sister of Moses, down to Salome Alexandra, who headed the Hasmonean kingdom during its golden days after the, uh, uh, the Maccabean revolt, which we'll talk about in lessons 12 and 13 at the end. Uh, and even in our own time, Golda Meir, uh, women have always played a prominent role and decisive role in Jewish history. And Deborah stands out as the God-inspired fighter for her country's freedom and her people's uh, survival. And Deborah called on Barak, one of the most promising or perhaps the most outstanding of the tribal leaders from Kadesh in Naphtali, up here to the north. Um, let's see, Jeff, you got the second reading? Uh, yes, Judges yeah. 4, 6, and 7. And she yes. sent and called Barak, the son of Abinim, Obinim, out of Kibadash Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and all the children of Zebulun? And I will draw unto thee the river of Kishon, Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him unto thine hand. Okay, so in other words, Deborah gave Barak the gist of a complete multi-phase plan of battle to throw off the Canaanite league. Uh, before going into detail, it's important to stress once more that the Canaanite supremacy in regular set battle because of their chariots and their regular heavily armed infantry. Uh, the number of Sisera's chariots is given as 900. And this number can be verified by comparing it with the number of Canaanite chariots that was quoted by Pharaoh Tutmos III. Remember in the video uh, a couple of thousand years earlier, Tutmos III attacked the Canaanites uh, in the city of Megiddo and actually won that battle. And in the booty that they collected, they collected like 924 chariots. And this was during a period when Megiddo was, uh, was more prosperous, you know, than it was at the time of this event. So saying that, that uh, Sisera had 900 chariots kind of rings true, because that's about the number you'd expect them to have. Um, with all this in mind, Deborah developed a, a three-phased campaign. Phase one was the concentration of the tribal contingents of Nathali and Zebulun, a total of not less than about 10,000 men, possibly 20,000. Concentrate them on Mount Tabor, which is located here. Mount Tabor, 
as a concentration area was easily defensible base against which chariots had no chance of success. They were in a unique flanking position for hostile traffic moving uh, through the Jezreel Valley in either direction. Um, they had great visibility in all directions. And last but not least, it was a perfect staging area for a surprise attack on the enemy that would be encamped at the foot of the mountains. So phase two was based on the assumption that when informed of the Israelite deployment, when Sisera found this out, he would then concentrate all his available forces to contain Barak within the bounds of Mount Tabor and try to force him eventually to battle in the open plain. Counting on this, Deborah proposed employing the forces that she gathered in Ephraim, which is down here to the south, where you see the tribe of Manasseh. She was going to gather these troops and draw Sisera away from Mount Tabor towards the swampy area of the Kishon River in the western part of the Jezreel Valley. And then in phase three, near the Kishon Valley, where the swampy soil in the rainy season hindered both man and horse and chariots alike in their movement and their maneuverability, the Canaanites would then attack simultaneously by Deborah's forces attacking northward into the Jezreel and Barak's forces attacking the flanks or the rear of uh, Sisera's army. The exact uh, course of Deborah's proposed diversion is not apparent from the Bible. So logically, it had to be something, uh, some kind of threatening movement that her troops in Ephraim would make towards the unprotected plain on the shores of Haifa Bay, in this area here, the, in the plains of Asher, or thereabouts. Only a movement of that kind that endangered a major partner of the coalition, such as uh, the kings of Dor and the kings of Tanakh and Megiddo and Jokneam, uh, that kind of threat, it would take something of that magnitude to draw Sisera to abandon his guard of Barak on Mount Tabor, break camp, and move quickly towards the Kishon River to secure this narrow pass, uh, Kishon Pass, between Carmel and the Tybon Hills located here, leading into the coastal plain from Jezreel. But... Barak balked at the idea of shouldering the main burden himself, and he would only agree to Deborah's plan if she accompanied the forces under his command. So Deborah then made her very famous reply, Linda and Andy. So oh, she replied, "I will go with you, but you will not not receive honor. You will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman." So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. <laughs> Go, Deborah. <laughs> I, <like that. laughs> I bet that made Barak feel really good. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the forces from Mount Ephraim then, where she was going to lead, were then placed under the command of some unnamed captain, we don't know who, and Deborah then joined the forces uh, at uh, Kadesh Naphtali, and from there they moved to Mount Tabor. According to the Bible, Heber, the Kenite, the Kenite was uh, head of a semi-nomad clan that was related to the Israelites from a couple of thousand years before. He gave away to Sisera the concentration point of the Israelites. But when we view what subsequently developed after that, and when we specifically look at the behavior of Heber's wife, Jael, when she encountered the uh, Canaanite commander, it seems that Heber must have been in collusion with Deborah. And his action was part of her overall plan to concentrate Sisera's attention on Mount Tabor and away from Mount Ephraim. So it appears that Heber the Kenite was probably a double agent. And it was part of the plan that he'd give away the location of Barak's forces that were collected at uh, Mount Tabor. So when Sisera learned that the Israelite concentration, uh, when he learned about it, he reacted just as predicted, 
and he collected his entire army to oppose Deborah and Barak. The opposing forces watched each other for a few days, and you might think that Deborah was waiting for rain to turn the western Jezreel around the Kishon River and its tributaries into a quagmire. And when, re when she received the, the confirmation she had hoped for, she gave Barak the sign to attack. And uh, Dick. And Deborah uh, 4, said 14. unto Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him. Okay, so the diverting force of the Ephraimites must have received the order to move some hours earlier. Uh, we don't know how far they got, but Deborah's song of victory after the battle in Judges chapter 5, which you can read later, mentions a crucial encounter with the kings of Canaan. Uh, back to uh, Janet, Judges 5.19. Okay. The kings came and fought. Then they fought those kings of Canaan at Tanakh by the waters of the Megiddo. No silver booty did they take. Okay, so it seems that when uh, the Ephraimites entered the Jezreel Valley, the tribesmen from Mount Ephraim were intercepted by forces from the towns on the southern fringes of the valley, like Tanakh and Megiddo, etc. Um, and they were probably on guard uh, against just such a contingency. Uh, but at all events, anyway, Sisera's attention was then drawn to this new threat in his rear, which threatened the insufficiently protected regions in the West. So he moved to the assistance of his allies. And then sometime after this, Deborah's command to attack was given. Her assault was effected from the foothills of Lower Galilee, and she caught Sisera's troops in the flanks or the rear or possibly both. And at that point, the Ephraimite force also joined in the battle. Uh, so, Jeffrey, you got Judges 415. Okay. And the Lord discomforted Sisera and all his chariots and all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. Okay, so a, a sudden downpour uh, aided in the Israelites considerably and helped turn Sisera's defeat into a total rout. And the Song of Deborah talks explicitly of the heavenly intervention and tells how the Kishon River rose and swept away in its torrent the enemy's horses and chariots. And when the Canaanite ranks became disorganized, Sisera panicked. And instead of trying to save as much as possible from the debacle so as to fight another day, he jumped off his chariot and he fled on foot to his death at the hands of Jael, who was the wife of Heber the Kenite, in whose tent that he uh, sought uh, safety. Uh, let's see, who's next? Linda, you've got Judges 4, 17 to 22. Oop, can't hear you. Hello? Okay, just a second. Can you unmute me? Oh, there you go. Okay, all right. Okay. Meanwhile, Sisera ran to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Canite, because Heber's family was on friendly terms with, with King Jabin of Hazor. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come into my tent, sir. Come in. Don't be afraid. So he went into her tent and she covered him with a blanket. Please give me some water, he said, I'm thirsty. So she gave him some milk from a leather bag and covered him again. Stand at the door of the tent, he told her. If anybody comes and asks you if there is anyone here, say no. But when Sisera fell asleep from exhaustion, Jael quietly crept up to him with a hammer and tent peg in her hand. Then she drove the tent peg through his temple and into the ground, and so he died. Hmm. When Barak came looking for Sisera, Jael went out to meet him. She said, come, and I will show you the man you are looking for. So he followed her into the tent and found Sisera lying there dead with the tent peg through his temple. 
Mm. Way to go. Um, I guess you could say she <laughs> nailed it. I am woman, hear me roll. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, I, you know. That's a rough lady. In, uh, in Sunday school and in church, I never heard this passage before. <laughs> <laughs> This is one that's not often talked about. <laughs> okay. So it's like, it's, it's like the women are in charge of everything now. <laughs> How smart were they? Yeah. I meant that in a good okay, way. Okay, here's, in a good way. All right, here's another map. Um, you, you've, you've seen this one before. Can get rid of that one. Do, do, do. Uh, like most of the book of, of Judges, uh, the facts that you see in chapters seven and eight that deal with the campaigns of Gideon are overlaid with the conflicting tribal traditions reflecting an inner tribal rivalry, rivalries uh, of the age. Keep in mind that th these 12 tribes are still a loose coalition. And even though they, they worked together frequently, particularly during periods of when they were oppressed and were seeking help, uh, but they, they were still somewhat rivals uh, in certain instances. And uh, some of those traditions uh, were hard to overcome. So Gideon's war against the clans that are located on the desert fringes was a consequence of the settlement of the Israelite tribes in this area. They, a lot of Israelite tribes managed to settle in Transjordan on the uh, Transjordan uh, Plateau here uh, on the edges of the, uh, the desert. And because they straddled the area between the desert and the arable land, it became increasingly apparent that the climate of Palestine hasn't changed a whole lot since biblical times. And if you were to draw a line to connect the points of, of equal rainfall that average six inches or more a year on the map, that line would pass just like it does now, south of Beersheba here in the south and east of Amman here, parallel to the line of the current modern railway uh, eight inches are the minimum for settled agriculture life other than by special irrigation, which they didn't have at the time. Consequently, any minor fluctuations in precipitation would cause uh, temporary emergencies in countries in the north and in the west. But on these arid, arid uh, the fringes of the uh, arable land towards the desert, Wells would dry up, cisterns would empty, and the, the, the pastures would dry, would dry up. It was very crucial. So in these situations, uh, the tribesmen who were roaming the Sinai in the south and the central Negev and the eastern Transjordan, those tribes had no alternative but to make inroads into the fertile country. And the longer the drought lasted, the more severe the scope, the more desperate was the situation of the nomads, and the harder they fought uh, in their hostile raids of conquest aimed at occupying, along with their flocks and their families, for as long as possible, large pasture lands in the arable areas. So one of the primary functions of any central authority throughout the ages that wanted to guarantee safe and undisturbed life in Israel was to organize and maintain permanent and competent border defenses against the raids and invasions from the desert. And during the period of the judges, which was about 400 years, uh, prior to the establishment of a centralized government in Israel, no such defense could be contemplated. Uh, Dick, I think you're next. Judges 6, yep. 1 through 5. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up 
and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Okay, so this was uh, after Deborah and, and before Gideon. It was during that time. Um, if it, one of the things to remember about the judges is that it wasn't a succession. Uh, when one judge died, there, another judge didn't take their place. There, weren't, there was no judge because Israel would be at peace until they wander off the path and then they become oppressed and then they cry for help and then a new judge would appear. So um, the answer uh, of the southern tribes of Judah and Simeon to the threats uh, seemed initially to have been uh, of a passive nature. They would hastily withdraw into their refuges, leaving their villages and their fields to the nomads. And encouraged by this, uh, the desert tribes staged a wholesale invasion of northern Palestine by galloping on their fast camels through Gilead, east of the Jordan, and penetrating all the way into the Jezreel Valley. And at this stage of eminent disaster, the northern tribes, they chose a different path than their southern brothers. Apparently, their policy was inspired by the one single individual, Gideon, who was the judge leader of the clan of Avizier, who had settled at Ophrah. And if you look here, Ophrah is a city that's right in the main crossroads in the center of the Jezreel Valley. And hearing that the vast nomad host had encamped on the northern foothills of the hill of Moray and around the spring of Endor, which is located here, Gideon decided on an offensive action, and he succeeded in mobilizing the tribal contingents from Asher and from Zebulun and from Natali and from Manasseh. He combined all of them. And while Gideon was waiting for the concentration of his forces, his problems were clear. In daylight, there was no chance whatsoever of luring the enemy to battle. Gideon's only chance lay in surprising his enemy while they were dismounted from their fast camels and off guard. In other words, they were going to attack the desert raiders at night. To do so, he needed to have a hand-picked force small enough to minimize the danger of noise and the greater part of the force could subsequently be employed to block any retreat westwards of the surprise raiders and to maneuver them into a vast killing ground between Mount Geboa here and the eastern edges of the Sumerian Ridge here and the Jordan River, making this whole area, the Harod Valley, all the way down through, down to the Jordan, a vast killing ground. Uh, Gideon first occupied with choosing from his 32,000 men a, a small shock troop of 300 for his night attack. And by a spark of inspiration, Gideon chose his small task force by observing the habits and the behavior of his men while he led them in full daylight to the spring of Herod, right here, where they might have been attacked at any time by the enemy, which could have mounted a guard on, on the summit of the hill of Moray and, Moray and seen them coming. So the men were chosen who, in spite of their thirst, remained cautious of the presence of the enemy nearby and did not abandon their weapons even when drinking, which they managed to do so by lying down flat on their bellies and lapping up the water with their tongues while keeping their eyes up and their weapons in their hands. So uh, who's next? We we'll back to Janet. Yep. Judges seven four or Judges seven four through seven. Okay, the Lord said to Gideon, "There are still too many soldiers. Lead them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. If I tell you that a certain man is to go with you, he must go with you. But no one is to go if I tell you he must not." When Gideon led the soldiers down to the water, the Lord said to him. 
You shall set to one side everyone who laps up the water as a dog does with its tongue. To the other, everyone who kneels down to drink. Those who lapped up the water raised to their mouths by hand numbered 300, but all the rest of the soldiers knelt down to drink the water. The Lord said to Gideon, by means of the 300 who lapped up the water, I will save you and will deliver Midian into your power. So let all the other soldiers go home. So after having built and deployed his forces according to plan, Gideon decided upon a personal reconnaissance of the enemy and his positions to ensure a complete surprise. Uh, so Jeffrey, you got Judges 7, 10 through 14. But if thou fear to go down, go through with Plurar, thy servant, down to the host. And thou shalt hear what they say, and afterward shall thine hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then went he down to Purah, his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. And the Mennonites and the Achlamidites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number as they sand by the sea for the multitude. Oh, so, um, I think you want me to go on? I thought it was 12. 10 through, 10 through 14. All right. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, behold, I dreamed in a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of the Midian, and then came unto a tent, and smote it, that it fell, overturned it, and the tent lay along. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon on the host, on the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. Okay, so according to the biblical narrative, Gideon and his personal assistant, or more likely his sword bearer, infiltrated the enemy camp, and they listened to the conversations. And based on what he heard, Gideon made his final plans. Each soldier was provided with a burning torch hidden in an earthen jar and a trumpet, or more likely some carried trumpets and some carried torches. And the small force was divided into three parties which approached the Midianite camp from three different directions simultaneously, as you see here on the map. When they reached the camp's perimeter, Gideon gave the prearranged signal, and with a great shout and blowing of trumpets, the attackers broke the earthen jars and probably threw the torches at the tents of the nomads, uh, frightening man and beast alike. And in the ensuing confusion, and because of the sudden blinding light, the raiders panicked and here and there they were even mistakenly attacking each other. And finally they were driven off as planned into the gorge between the mountains and down to the Jordan River. And now while the men of Manasseh, uh, down here in the south, uh, That on my, oh, here it is. Yeah, Manasseh. The tribe of Manasseh located right here. The men of Manasseh had been alerted to join with forces from Natali and Asher to harass the enemy in their flight. It was only then that Gideon gave a last-minute alert to the clans of Ephraim settled around the main fords. Here's the tribe of Ephraim. They were settled around the main fords of the Jordan River. Remember, a ford is a likely uh, crossing point. Uh, near the city of Adam. Uh, and he called upon them to occupy the fords and block any of the nomads that tried to flee. They did so with partial success and in the struggle to gain uh, a foothold across the Jordan River, two of the nomad chieftains were killed. It's quite likely because of that inner tribal animosity I talked about earlier, made Gideon wait until the last possible moment before he called on the Ephraimites, and had he had done so sooner, the Midianite route may have been more complete. And the Ephraimites later on told him so, 
and he had a hard time appeasing their anger for leaving them sort of out of the picture until the last minute. But in, in spite of these drawbacks, uh, Gideon pressed on and succeeded once more in surprising his enemy not far from the border of Ammon, um, somewhere in the mountains near Jogbeha, right here in the far eastern, southeastern corner of the map there. And this is where the exhausted desert raiders stopped to rest. Uh, they assumed that they were a safe distance away from Gideon and, and near neutral or, uh, in this instance, friendly territory of Amman. Uh, the details are lacking, but we know that Gideon succeeded in surprising and annihilating his enemy there. Uh, who's got Judges 8-11? Next up. Gideon circled around by the caravan route east of Noba and Jobbeha, taking the Midianite army by surprise. Okay, so the decision to split his forces and to stage the attack at the hill of Moray with only 300 men is an early example of what uh, the military describes as a calculated risk. The decision was based largely upon exact personal uh, checking of intelligence about the enemy's location, about their dispositions and their morale. One problem remains to be solved, and, and, and that's why did these quick mobile raiders give Gideon the time to concentrate his forces and prepare for battle on his own terms? In other words, how did they uh, come to be encamped against their own customs for at least a few days on the same spot? at the foot of the hill of Moray, instead of pushing westward. And the answer lies in Gideon's remarks when he refused to grant the captured Midianite chieftains their lives. Um, Dick, you have Judges 8, 18 to 19. Yep. Then said he unto Zeba and Zalmunna, what manner of men were they whom ye slew at Tabor? And they answered, as thou art, so were they. Each one resembled the children of a king. And he said, they were my brethren, even the sons of my mother. As the Lord liveth, if ye had saved them alive, I would not slay you. Okay. So the most reasonable reconstruction of events seems to be that when he learned of the Midianite approach, Gideon sent a hastily assembled force, conceivably a small number, to block the enemy advance in the narrow valley between Mount Tabor here and the hill of Moray here, this open plain. He sent a small force here to block them so they wouldn't get past this point. Their mission was to stop the enemy advance at all costs and give Gideon time he needed to gather his forces, uh, which was built largely around his own kinsmen. And this force was probably led by his brothers. So in the ensuing encounter, his brothers lost their lives, but the passage was blocked. So that's, that's why his comment when he uh, met the Midianite chieftains that were captured, you know, he asked them, who were these men that you fought? And they basically said, well, they look like, you know, the sons of kings, etc." And then uh, Gideon told him, yeah, you're right. The people that you killed were my brothers. And if you had let them live, I would have, I would let you live, but that, that's not to be. Uh, skipping ahead, down here, um, Abimelech, uh, Gideon's son, Abimelech, achieved notoriety for his cruel fratricide, and I'll let you read that on your own. It's pretty gruesome. Uh, his historical importance is that he was the first to attempt to impose some kind of centralized hereditary rule on ancient Israel, or parts of it anyway. And if you read Judges chapter 9, you'll understand how he went about doing that. Uh, his campaigns have to be mentioned here, though, insofar as they demonstrate the progress that the Israelites siegecraft. Following Abimelech's war against the, uh, the town of Shechem here, or Shvem, as it's properly pronounced, and his war against the Shvemites we find that it was still mainly by stealth and by trickery and contact with allies that were located within the besieged city that he tried to overcome his defenses. Uh, and this is where Judges chapter 9, 22 through 45, which we're not going to read, comes in. 
and during the height of the contest, he succeeded in drawing off a large number of the defenders from the city and managed to enter through the gate. Sort of using the same kind of strategy that Joshua used when he attacked the city of Ai, if you remember that from last week. Abimelech's next move uh, proves to, that he had already mastered the technique of using fire to smoke out defenders of smaller fortifications, as well as to set fire to their wooden components, especially their most vulnerable spots, which were the gates. So who's got the next reading? I think I do. Okay, nine, Judges 9, 46 to 49. Oh, I thought it was 52 to 54. 46. Okay. No, nope, that comes next. Okay. So you didn't give that one to us. Yeah, I had the same as she did. That's all right. Oh, I guess because we skipped that one. So we skipped you want, the long one. So you want me to read 46? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. 46 to 49, and then Jeffrey, you can do 52 to 54. Okay. okay. When they heard of this, all the citizens of the Migdal Shechem went into the crypt of the temple of Elbereth. It was reported to Abimelech that all the citizens of Migdal Shechem were gathered together. So he went up Mount, Z Mount, Zion, Mount Zalman with all his soldiers, took his ax in his hand and cut down some brushwood. This he lifted to his shoulder, then said to the men with him, hurry, do just as you have seen me do. So all the men likewise cut down brushwood and followed Abimelech, placed it against the crypt. Then they set the crypt on fire over their heads so that every one of the citizens of Migdal Shechem, about a thousand men and women perished. Okay, so it was in one of these such operations that, uh, that he met his death. Abimelech died as violently as he had lived but his death did have kind of an irony. So Jeff, you could read uh, 52 to 54. And Ambibolic came unto the tower and fought against it and went hard into the door of the tower to burn it with fire. And a certain woman cast a piece of millstone upon Ambolic's head and all to break his skull. <laughs> Again, with, with the women. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't read 54. I stopped. Go ahead. Then he called hastily unto the young man his armor bearer and said unto him, Draw thy sword and slay me, that men say not of me. A woman slew him, and he and his young man thrust him through, and he died. <laughs> That's pretty rough stuff. Yeah, huh? he, he, he didn't want history to, to record that he was killed by a woman. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, this is a pretty violent period, and that's, that's pretty much it for the day. Uh, <laughs> we, we covered uh, Deborah and Barak's war uh, with the Sisera, and we covered uh, Gideon's war with the Desert Raiders. And then we only mentioned Abimelech and because of uh, the advances that the Israelites are starting to make in siege craft. So, any questions? I don't have a question, but I'd like to say what you said before. I learned none of this in Sunday school. <laughs> <laughs> As a kid, I was in no. Sunday school from the time I could walk until I was like in college. We learned yeah. about Daniel and uh, some of the other stories, but none of this. No, no, none of this. Uh -uh. I didn't think I remember oh, this in my ROTC uh, military history course either. <laughs> <laughs> no. Because of all those women. <laughs> I think we would be better with okay. that. You know? Well, so the, these battles are all because of the ground they held, just like in many other battles, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they were defending their, their uh, civilization. Uh, they were defending their religion, but they were also defending their families, their crops, their flocks. I mean, it, the desert raiders were, were trying to take it away from them. And it went, like I said, whenever there was a, a period of drought, it, it would become really severe. Mm -hmm. um, and at this time in uh, uh, history, Israelite history, 
you know, we're talking 1180 uh, BC, they still did not have a unified monarchy and they were sort of, the tribes were sort of left to their own devices, basically. So it was a hard time. Hmm. Ba -da, ba -da, ba -da, ba -da. Thank you. Thanks, Warren. Thank well, you, Warren. Thank you, Warren. See you next week, if not before. Oh, yeah. Next week, we'll be talking about uh, the founding of the, uh, the kingdom, the United Monarchy, and we'll talk about the founding of the standardized army. Okay. So we'll see you next week, one okay. day, one day next week. Buenas okay. tardes. Bye. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. Alpha Wiener Schnitzel. <laughs> <laughs> Hamburg, you. <laughs>